In this video, we're going to look at how Mercutio's uh, Queen Mab speech reveals his feelings about Romeo. Um, so the first thing I'm going to point out is that the first line, as all of this speech, is in iambic pentameter, which means that the second syllable is stressed all the time. Um, and you'll notice that the first line is all one-syllable words. Oh, then I see Queen Mab have been with you. And you can see when I read it that way that there's a big uh, emphasis on been and you. And I'm going to suggest that that shows Mercutio's jealousy at Romeo's feelings of love. So he assumes that the dream Romeo is going to tell him about is a dream of Rosaline, this woman that he keeps going on about that he's in love with. And Mercutio's just about had enough of that. And there's possibly an element of jealousy uh, so the jealousy could be, uh, Romeo used to be a really good friend who was always up for a laugh. They're part of a gang, if you like, um, a gang of mates. And uh, he's fed up with this lovesick person that Romeo has become. And in the Baz Luhrmann film, uh, Baz Luhrmann takes this a step further and suggests that Mercutio's jealousy is caused by an unspoken love for Romeo. In the film, he can't confess his homosexuality because it's an obviously macho culture. But that, remember, is just the film. And then the next line um, completely breaks with the iambic pattern. She is the fairy's midwife, and she comes... And we can see the stresses are all over the place here, and that possibly reflects Mercutio's dissatisfaction with the idea of love. Uh, Queen Mab represents love here, and Mercutio's had enough of it. He has no truck with love, he has no time for love. The next lines just reveal his imagination. He's just enjoying himself, uh, creating this alternative universe, if you like, populated by fairies and tiny creatures um, smaller than the stone on a ring of a councilman. Uh, but then he becomes quite violent in his imagery. So Queen Mab rides athwart across men's noses, but athwart instead of across uh, has thwart in it, um, which means to stop and prevent. And there's a subtext here that love is thwarting men, it's, um, it's attacking them, it's stopping them being um, wholly male, if you like. And again, Baz Luhrmann would use this to suggest that um, in Mercutio's world of manliness, um, it's, uh, it's about desire for other men. Uh, but of course, Shakespeare might never have intended this, and he could just be talking about men being better off as men without the company of women. Uh, something which a modern audience is probably quite used to. And then he decides that the part of men's bodies that she shall ride over is their noses. Um, and perhaps this suggests he's turning his nose up at love. Um, and that's why he gets Queen Mab to ride across the men's noses. There's something unsavoury about it. And uh, a lot of um, attention is paid in Shakespeare's time to smell because, of course, uh, things smell really bad. And then she rides, um, instead of a carriage, she rides a chariot. And this, perhaps, um, reveals Mercutio's warlike anger. It suggests how angry he is at Romeo here. And um, he's expressing that anger by giving a chariot um, to Queen Mab. And because Queen Mav represents dreams of love, he starts to become disgusted with her. Um, so a flight of fancy is that the squirrel makes her carriage, but then the squirrel becomes an old grub, something uh, disreputable, slightly disgusting. And uh, that reflects Mercutio's feelings about Romeo's interest in love, and perhaps his own feelings towards love generally. Next we have the description of the chariot and what it's made out of. And most um, critics will see this as evidence of Mercutio's light-heartedness. Um, 
he loves to play with words and he loves all these imageries uh, all this image images of um, tiny little uh, spiders and grasshoppers and he's creating a miniature world but if we look more closely we can also pick up that sense of disgust again so the wagon spokes are made out of um, spiders legs and the wings of grasshoppers uh, make a cover so clearly this grasshopper has been slaughtered its wings just pulled off in barbaric fashion um, and then there's more made out of a spider's web uh, the moonshine's beams a beautiful romantic image um, brings us back to fantasy but immediately that um, he mentions these watery beams he becomes dissatisfied with this sense of romance and immediately introduces a whip again that language of violence and it's made out of a cricket's bone again um, horrible insect like creature that again has been killed and its bone is here and then that violent language again lash um, and then it's uh, driven if you like so the wagoner is the driver by a small gnat um, and this gnat instead of being resplendent in purple or red is grey coated again reflecting how drab um, love is in Mercutio's eyes and showing how disgusted he is and once again I'll bring you back to that language of violence lash and whip uh, the wings torn off um, off the grasshoppers, uh, the cricket's bone. So not just disgust, but real anger at um, Romeo's feelings of love. So on the one hand, this um, speech celebrates Mercutio's um, imagination. Um, he loves to play with words. He's a trickster, if you like, uh, but when we look more deeply, we see how it shows his disgust and um, his anger at love itself and at Romeo's being in love. To continue his theme of disgust, he becomes uh, sexual in his uh, imagery. Uh, so it's not so big as a round little worm. Um, well, so far that's just carrying on the insect imagery. But this worm is pricked from the lazy finger of a maid, a virgin. Uh, so pricked is obviously a sexual allusion here um, to his penis, or to a person's penis. And the, maze, the maid is lazy. She's lost interest in this penis. Um, obviously she's still a virgin, which is why she's playing with it with her hands. But the penis now becomes a little worm. Um, disgusting. Because literally, it's uh, something like ringworm, isn't it, that's coming out directly from her finger and it's been pricked out, say, with a needle um, to get rid of an infection. So here, Mercutio sees uh, love as an infection, or another way of looking at it is that it's a parasite. Um, again, disgusting. It's important to Mercutio that he paints her in this disgusting way before he lets her loose through lovers' brains. In other words, he's clearly um, showing how love is a real illness. Next, he draws a parallel between um, lovers and the other people who are infected by Queen Mab. So he picks on courtiers. Courtiers are people at the royal court who are trying to curry favour, get influence uh, from the Queen and so they curtsy and bow, and there's something distasteful about that, which he then matches to lawyers, and he picks on their fingers because they're greedy for money, they dream on fees. Uh, so love is like this kind of dream. Uh, for courtiers it's for advantage, for lawyers it's for money, and then he turns his attack against ladies. Um, it sounds romantic, ladies dream of kisses, but then look at what uh, Mercutio has Queen Mab do. She blisters their lips with plagues. Uh, so on one level this is suggesting that um, women carry infection with them. You know, they look nice and they look kissable. But underneath it, um, 
they bring a plague. Um, perhaps this is a metaphorical one, merely saying you're better off without women, uh, they'll try and control you. Or it could be um, an unsubtle way of talking about uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so you're very likely to get infected not just with love, uh, but with a sexually transmitted disease if you start um, being romantic with women. Uh, then he suggests that um, women disguise their bad breath, probably they've got tooth decay, by um, eating sweet meats um, that will make their breath smell better. But the idea here is deception. And so he sees that love is just another form of deception. Um, with Romeo, it's self-deception. He's self-deluded. He thinks he's in love, but actually he isn't. Um, and that, of course, is what happens in the play. The minute he sees Juliet, he realises that his love for Rosalind was imaginary. Then he repeats the image of the courtier, and this time the, the courtier is nosing out another advantage, uh, smelling out a suit. A suit is a request, um, possibly for land or influence, um, a position, uh, a job, if you like, at court. Uh, so he's emphasising again how love is corrupt, it's, uh, and Romeo's love is corrupt because it's just out of self-interest. Romeo is deceiving himself. Uh, perhaps Mercutio is suggesting that really all Romeo wants is sex, and he's confusing this desire with love. Uh, next, Mercutio attacks um, the parson, uh, equivalent of the vicar, and um, the parson would collect money from um, people in the village and they would pay from their crops, um, say 10% of their crops, to the church. And that was called a tithe. And Mercutio is now suggesting uh, that this whole idea of paying uh, God, if you like, is also corrupt. Uh, this is quite a dangerous idea uh, in Shakespeare's time, suggesting that... Um, the clergy are also corrupt because it's a short step to saying that um, your love of God and the belief that God loves you is also a self-deception. Uh, then the parson dreams of benefice, more money. Um, so again, he is corrupt just after looking after his own interests. Again, Mercutio suggesting that Romeo is the same. He's only interested in himself. Therefore, it's not real love. It's just a desire for sex or um, influence with a beautiful woman. Next, he has uh, Shakespeare has Mercutio um, think about soldiers. And this time, it's not soldiers' noses that uh, Mab drives over. It's their necks, because this reminds us of death. Uh, not just their own death, but also killing uh, foreign throats. At this time, of course, um, the English have just fought a war against the Spanish. Uh, they fought the Spanish um, when the Spanish invaded with the Spanish Armada. Um, so real history is being used here. But uh, Mercutio is suggesting that the soldiers have become bloodthirsty through Queen Mab's um, dreams that she's given them. She's made them uh, thirst for killing people. Again, a very violent and disgusting image, suggesting that Romeo's love is disgusting, and that it's also based on lust, not love at all, just as the soldiers lust after uh, bloodshed and killing. And at this stage, his language becomes much more violent. So obviously we've seen the violence uh, here, but uh, let's look at the sounds. The alliteration of the B in breeches, ambuscado, Spanish blades. You can see a percussive drum-like beat building up. And uh, that's picked up here, drums in the ear. And if I take you back to the stresses, um, it's no longer iambic. It's not drums in his ear. It's drums in his ear. Yeah, the stresses are changing at which he starts and wakes, then it becomes iambic again. But changing the iambic rhythm here happens to reveal Mercutio's anger, his growing anger at Romeo.
Then he appears to try to calm himself. He uses sibilance, the repetition of an S sound. Starts, wakes, thus, swears. You can see this sibilance uh, trying to calm down, bring a softer sound, and sleeps again. And here it is, here's the spelling of sibilance. So it looks here as though um, Mercutio is starting to correct himself. He realises he's becoming overdramatic, overly angry, and he's probably realising that he's overreacting to Romeo's feelings. He's taking it a bit too far. And uh, you can take this as evidence of Mercutio's feelings towards Romeo. They must be really, really strong for him to get very angry. And uh, this is backed up immediately by how he now continues. Uh, this is the very Mab. So he starts on another attack. And we can see this a growing anger again in the pattern of his language. So we've got that repeated here with that. We've got which and this and this. Um, building up one point after another after another. Really showing how angry he is um, with Queen Mab. Next, he calls a hag something old and uh, witch-like and disgusting, uh, again showing how angry he is with the idea of love. Um, now he starts to concentrate on um, this sort of description, foul and sluttish. He's talking about the manes of horses, um, but why? Uh, this seems to have been a kind of a random image, um, unless... It's a symbol for misfortune. Uh, this is quite interesting because Mercutio is perhaps picking up on Romeo's worries. Romeo knows that if he goes to the party, he's going to suffer misfortune. But that's the dream that he's just about to reveal um, to Mercutio. Uh, so there's a kind of um, almost a telepathic link here between Romeo's mood and Mercutio's. It shows how well they know each other that Mercutio has picked up on Romeo's um, worries, that uh, maybe he isn't just lovesick, he's actually worried about fate, misfortune, something terrible is going to happen if they go to this party. And then the language that he uses here is also quite revealing. He says that Queen Mab presses the young virgins, the maids, uh, so this means persuades and keeps telling them, doesn't let up, nagging if you like, but it's also a sexual image. They're on their backs, and Queen Mab is pressing onto them as though she's actually having sex with them. And this leads them to learning how first to bear, uh, how to become pregnant. Um, so there's a, an almost a joke here, suggesting that um, if love were enough, then women would get pregnant um, simply from being in love with a man. But actually, it's not really about love, is it? It's all about sex. So this is um, Mercutio's unspoken message to Romeo here. Look, you're just thinking about sex. Your emotions aren't really real. And then finally in this section, we've got uh, this break in the line here. Um, and we assume from that that the Mercutio has become louder and louder and louder. Uh, which is going to prompt Romeo to interrupt him and finally stop his angry rant, his tirade. And this is why Romeo reacts uh, to placate him, to calm him down, repeating peace three times, and then ironically uh, telling him that he's understood nothing of what he said. So everything that we've been through here, all this kind of coded message that... Mercutio's sending to Romeo has all been wasted on him. Uh, Mercutio, uh, Romeo has listened, but all he's heard is Mercutio's anger. And Romeo's got no idea what the anger is directed at. He doesn't realise it's directed at him, which is why he says here, you're talking about nothing. You know, I don't even know what you're angry at. Um, so from Mercutio's point of view, this is a clear breakdown in their relationship. We've seen how he clearly um, understands Romeo's worries about misfortune, um, but in return, 
Romeo has understood nothing about Mercutio.